This is New Zealand, Aotearoa. We are blessed with majestic mountains, beautiful forests, rivers, and a spectacular wild coastline, all 19,000 kilometres of it. I'm Craig Potton, and like many New Zealanders, I actually learnt to swim not long after I could walk. I'm a photographer, a conservationist, and a surfer, and I just love the coast. I like exploring above it and in the water. On my coastal journeys, I'll encounter some wonderful sea creatures. I'll visit people that care for the coast, and I'll try to understand its place in our culture and our duty of care for it. On this journey, we're travelling down part of the east coast of New Zealand. Just yesterday, in geological time, all this land lay under the ocean, accumulating as marine sediments, before it was lifted up by powerful tectonic forces. It may not always seem so, but the east is more placid than the west. There's less powerful swells hitting it. And down these long, grey gravel beaches, there are some exceptional landscapes. I call them east coast gems. We'll start just north of Gisborne at Whangaraa and make our way down the coast, stopping at Cape Kidnappers, Castle Point, and then on to Kaikoura, ending at Banks Peninsula. We will visit a drowned volcano, see spectacular mountain uplift, and marvel at nature's abundance where deep oceanic trenches come close to shore. These are great habitats and feeding grounds for rare seabirds, the world's smallest dolphin, and that giant of sea mammals, the whale. While Kaikoura is the best place to see whales, their legend begins on a marae north of Gisborne. In Maori mythology, Paikia, the original ancestor of the Ngāti Konohi tribe, arrived here at Whangara from his ancestral homeland of Hawaiki, riding on the back of a whale. He still guards the entrance of the meeting house. Out from the coastline, a two humped rocky outcrop is said to be the fossilised remains of the whale that brought Paikia here. Writer Witi Ihamara reworked the legend to create a contemporary story of a girl descended from the whale rider. Māori elder Hone Tamonu knew Witi as a boy and would talk with him about the sea's mythology. Paikia is all part of our Tangaroa mythology or our ocean mythology and this is where he arrived and settled forever. We are very aware and very proud that we are the caretakers and the custodians of this particular genealogy. When the time came to make a film of the story, of course it was shot here in Whangaraa. The film worked its magic on audiences around the world, tapping into a universal fascination with these warm-blooded giants. The whole kind of idea of whales and being very close to humanity is interesting mm. because they're like a mother docile, they're not aggressive and also caring. They always have these human manifestations and uh, they're our ancestor. As timeless as Whangara seems, this place has changed a great deal since Hone was a boy, when crayfish and other seafood were plentiful. We'd go down to the rocks when the tide was out, then we'd go and see the feelers or the antennae of the crayfish, and we'd take enough three for each household. Our fishing would take us about 10 minutes. There was a lot of fish and a lot of crayfish out there when I was young. But so that was due to the fact there was no commercial fishing anyway. The steady decline of fish stocks here led Hone to convince his people they should initiate the first Māori no-take marine reserve. Well, let's make one thing quite clear. I don't think anybody owns anything. You know, the sea is for all people. But people must take responsibility for whatever they take from the sea. They have to return what they take. From the hill behind Whangaraa, you can see Poawa, the site of the reserve. 
Thanks to the locals' dedication and the work of the Department of Conservation, the crayfish are re-establishing here. Marine biologist Debbie Freeman has seen their numbers increase. And now we can even see crayfish antennae waving from the rock pools. So we're seeing them in very shallow water. That's exceptional, isn't it? Oh, it to is. Our, our normal understanding that's of them. That's right, that's right. I mean, that's one of the, the great things about marine reserves is that it gives us the opportunity to, to learn more about just the, the natural ecology of a species. Um, how big do they grow? How old do they get? Um, what's their natural behaviour? And these are animals that we thought were nocturnal and um, certainly not found in shallow rock pools like this for their feelers sticking out of the water. Since the reserve was created in 1999, over 7,000 crayfish have been tagged, allowing Debbie to gain an insight into their behaviour. During the mating season, um, the males will set up a, a, basically a den and they'll defend that against other males. And, and the females are attracted to um, the larger males, so a, a big male will set up a den and basically have a harem of, of females um, that it will mate with and, and protect um, during the mating season. The females will actively select the larger, larger males to mate with and obviously in a marine reserve where you get a, a, a bigger range of sizes of, of animals and, a, and larger males, larger females, the reproductive rate goes through the roof. You know, you're instantly getting an order of magnitude higher of egg production just because you've got a lot more animals to mate with. The safe environment of the marine reserve has even influenced how the crayfish respond to humans. Outside a marine reserve, if you swim past a crayfish, they'll duck back into their den, whereas here you swim past one and they'll, they'll come after you. you know, they'll, they're staunch. Yeah, yeah, they do, and they'll, they'll grab hold of your leg or your arm, and yeah, they're absolutely fearless. So what's the biggest thing you don't know about these creatures? What do you really want to know? Why are you keeping on doing research? Um, I think there's still a lot more to learn about these animals. Because they don't have any hard structures that they um, maintain permanently, um, because they molt each year, they lose their, their exoskeleton. We don't actually know how old they, how old they live. Um, we think probably maybe 40, 50 years old, but at least with um, places like marine reserves, they actually get a chance to, to get old, to get big. And now if we can do some, some more tagging studies or be able to identify individuals, we can actually track them and see how long they have them for. The next bay down from the reserve is Tatapori, where I've come for a close encounter with a magnificent, graceful sea creature. Like its relation, the shark, the stingray can be feared and misunderstood. At Dive Tatapori, Dean Savage shows visitors how to interact with these creatures safely. Personally, the stingray is a kaitiaki, is a guardian. It's one of the guardians that, that we have in our family. So uh, we have a close affinity with rays. This is not a reserve, so these are totally wild animals, as opposed to a lot of marine reserves and aquariums where, you know, they got no choice. They're, they're going to be around you whether they, whether they want to or not, but these animals can, can freely come and go. Mm. A big question, Dean, that some people want to know, how dangerous are rays? Well, totally wild rays can kill you, as we know. The rays that we work with, uh, because if they don't see us as a threat and we know how to behave around them, uh, are perfectly fine to work with. They're, one of their biggest defences is camouflage, so they lie, either bury themselves in the sand or lay prone on the, on the bottom. So you've got to be aware that they're actually trying to stay out of people's way. So when you go on the reef, walk slowly. If the water's murky, you should really try and shuffle your feet. Uh, given an opportunity, the ray will always swim away from you. The only time they're a threat to you is if you stand on them. The big rays don't particularly like the big swells, so they tend to move off into deeper water where it's a lot more sheltered. The only time they really disappear for periods is when they have the breeding season and they'll mass together in big numbers like they do in the poor nights. We've got reefs out here, they do the same thing. You'll get hundreds of stingrays coming together. And during that period, from what I hear at the poor nights, occasionally orcas will come through and have a real feed because yep, orcas yep. feed on rays. Yeah, we, we get uh, visits by orca Know, five, six times a year. Uh, word's got out now, we've got fat stingrays at Tatapuri, but you know, that's a natural cycle. Stingrays have been coming onto the reef for over 20 years to be fed by Dean and his father. The weather has been rough, 
and maybe that has driven them offshore. But Dean assures me they'll come in on the tide. So how are we getting them in? They're smelling the food that we're putting out out there. Your mate's putting food out. Yep, they are a type of shark, actually, a stingray. Right. So they've got the same acute sense of smell. So when we're feeding this bait fish, they can pick up the vibrations of the feeding going on. The real trigger is the tide. So as the tide starts moving in, which it's doing now, that's what encourages them to come onto the reef to feed. So it's just a matter of having the right amount of water on the reef and they'll, they'll come in. They'll come in. Yeah. You're confident about that? Very. You want to bet on it? Yeah. <laughs> I'll buy you beer later if Ray's coming. I'm laughing on the outside, but inside I'm really excited to have this wonderful creature coming straight towards me. I mean, I know it's just for the food, but even so, I've always been in awe of the seemingly effortless silent gliding of stingrays, but I never imagined a wild stingray could be drawn into the shallows in this way. I'm just awestruck by this monster 200 kilogram female short tail. How's that? I've just fed a wild ray. <laughs> He's got a little razor shot. I mean, it, 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 it's not hard on you, but it's almost like uh, sandpaper. Now, how much do you owe me? Uh, <laughs> I owe you a beer, mate, already. <laughs> they said they wouldn't actually bite and they wouldn't hurt, but they do bite and they do hurt, but that's OK, it's not too bad. Just a flesh wound, you know, we can handle that for sure for having a wild ray coming up, sitting on your knee and having, well, afternoon tea with you. I mean, that's pretty marvellous, isn't it? Oh, what a beauty. What a beauty. Oh, that's fantastic. You just let him come out again? He's seriously not scared of us, is he? No. Look how big he is. Oh, oh. After seven years, Dean has come to know these rays individually. You know, all animals, any round, cats, dogs, no matter what, you're going to get those individual characteristics coming out in any animal. And we do have the odd animal uh, that'll come through, and we got one in particular, the stroppy ray. And uh, it's not aggressive towards you in, in the sense that it'll try and hurt you, it's just the way it feeds. It is so demanding. It'll charge up your leg, knock you over. It's, 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 yeah, it's really stroppy. If you believed in rebirth, would yeah. you like to come back as a ray? I think I'd rather come back as a walker. <laughs> <laughs>
but somehow or other the wave went out and, and um, my grandparents clinging to the door frame, I gather, and the tide went out a very long way. Enough time for them, with help, to clamber up the bank and go as far up the bank as they possibly could. And that was it. But the wave had taken a toll on the area. The Powawa Bridge was washed away and fields of crops were swept out to sea. I, I don't know who took these photographs, but they certainly show oh, wow, examples that that, that that is yeah. the devastation. I mean, how no one died, you can imagine flying corrugated iron beams of wood. It's a miracle, isn't it? It, it is a miracle. It really is. I've left Gisborne and I'm on my way south, just past Napier to Cape Kidnappers. Here, the geology of this region is exposed in great coastal cliffs. These cliffs have layers of stories dating back millions of years, evidence of sedimentation, earthquakes, ancient rivers, and volcanic eruptions that occurred long before man. I've enlisted the help of a geologist, Hamish Campbell, to unravel some of what the cliffs can tell us. Hamish, the coastline must be one of the best places for what you're interested in, which is geology, opening up the earth. Absolutely. Right here, we can see at Cape Kidnappers, this whole coastline's been uplifted. Think of it like a carpet. So the edge of the carpet has literally been squashed, and a series of folds have been generated. And the folds, are, as you continue this process, the folds go up and the valleys go down. And that's pretty much the story of eastern North Island. So what are the pressures forcing the carpet to go? Well, this, this is plate collision. So this is the Pacific plate behaving like a bulldozer, uh, pushing in against the eastern edge of the Australian plate. New Zealand was once part of the great supercontinent Gondwana land, but around 100 to 85 million years ago, it began breaking off into a continental fragment of its own. And 65 million years ago, drifting well away from Australia and Antarctica, the Earth's crust was squeezed and stretched, rose up, subsided, and the islands of New Zealand gradually morphed into today's shape. The rate of plate collision is four to five centimetres a year. Somehow the land has to accommodate that pressure. As it builds, the movement occurs along the fault lines. This is the perfect example of a normal fault, where one side is ramped down the other. Right. And what about the layers, Hamish? Well, the most conspicuous layer up there that is offset is the dark brown layer. And that's exactly what this rock here is. It's gravel. Came tumbling off there. It's come tumbling off, the, off there and there's masses of it on the beach here. Great chunks of rock and gravel are falling from the cliffs all the time here. On a past visit, I photographed Papa Rock, the soft blue-grey mudstone that comes from this uplifted sea floor. One thing you often find on the coast is pumice. We've had some big volcanoes. Do they show in these cliffs? Absolutely. All the pale coloured rocks here are all volcanic ash deposits derived from the central North Island. So these represent eruptions and they've been deposited as airfall deposits straight out of the sky. And some of them are incredibly voluminous. They're really thick. They must have been huge eruptions. Now, as a kid, I loved going for fossils. I always loved the idea that I could find a seashell or, a, you know, a fossilised an old thing. Is this a good place for fossils? Oh, this is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, these cliffs are just stuffed full of fossils. Really? Yeah. As you go towards Cape Kidnappers, the rocks get older and older, and you get more and more marine sediments with conspicuous shelly fossils. In fact, Hamish has already found one in the cliff face, a beautiful shark's tooth. Well, I'd say this is about a million years old. A million year old shark teeth. Years old, yeah. I mean, yeah. shark's teeth are a wonderful prize for any fossil collector. Absolutely. Travelling on one of Colin Lindsay's vintage tractors, I've come down the coast at Cape Kidnappers to one of four gannet colonies. This bird is one of the few species that is increasing in numbers in the world today, and gannets have been attracting people to this area since the 1870s. So we are really close. I mean, are we disturbing the birds at all, just this close to them? They show little signs of agitation, but we're not really in their territory. So, um, yeah, we're quite comfortable with this. Because, I mean, these are chicks here, obviously, with, with the adults. How old are they? The first of the chicks we see out here at Cape Kidnappers in uh, November. 
and of course the first of those ones are actually already fledged. Um, the ones out here at the moment, some of them are getting ready, a few are a lot younger, and um, still showing all that beautiful white down there. Yeah, but I mean these guys with the downs just on the head, if you have a look around there, I mean that sort of guy, how, how old would he be? The particular guy on the right there, he'd be uh, you know, a good three months old now, and in, in the last month here he'll get rid of that, last of that down, and um, also bulk up a little bit for his first flight. So. So when's that first flight going to happen? When's it going to leap off the cliff here? We sort of like to think they'll be heading off from here for sort of 15, 16 weeks. And yep, first flight is leaping off of here. That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? It's, it's incredible to watch. You, know? you watch it, one? It, yep, yep. We, um, we're lucky enough to see it occasionally, and, and it is a real special moment, you know. Four months sitting up here, you know, mum and dad feeding him, and then one day he thinks he's ready. It's, and he's it's, off. It's, it's, it's impressive. Hey, come on, mate. Come on. Work those wings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, get it together. Get those wings going together. Yeah, beat away. Hey, you're nearly there. Uh, maybe you're getting a bit uncoordinated. Or uh, maybe you just forget it. Have a break for a while. Just why our gannets fly from New Zealand to Australia, while their counterparts in Australia stay put, is still a mystery. But after three or four years, our birds come home to the same spot to mate. Extraordinary birds in some ways, but some of these rock stacks <laughs> out here, not quite so intelligent. I mean, big storm, they, they're in trouble, aren't they? Yep. So it is a shame, the ones out there. Um, you know, every, every now and then we do get the, the storms in the wrong direction, but a wind behind the waves, and, and we do lose the, not the breeding birds, but the young. You know, of course, the young can't fly. Um, but yeah, back go the parents next year and have another shot, same nest. Once those two birds, you know, hook up, got the relationship going, establish a nest site together, then we expect them to go back there year in, year out. One thing that absolutely astounds me about these birds is when they're diving. It astounds me that they don't break every single bone in their body because they hit the water at up to 145 kilometres an hour. And when they hit the water, a little air sac forms in their stomachs here to cushion that impact. I mean, how it does it, it's just extraordinary, but their wings fold in. Once they're in the water, tens of metres down, they're still like this guided torpedo, almost straight towards the fish that they want. They grab it and pop back up to the surface. Gannets are wonderful opportunists. They take advantage of the dusky dolphins herding fish for them. The dolphins circle the fish and drive them into a concentrated mass, making easy pickings for the gannets. At Ocean Beach, just around from Cape Kidnappers, hundreds of years ago, Kiwis strolled around the sand dunes. Then humans changed the face of the east coast, clearing native bush and causing massive erosion. Native species retreated as their habitat disappeared, or they were killed by introduced predators. But in a private initiative, a group of landowners have banded together to create a sanctuary to reintroduce species lost to the area. Their first step was to build a colossal predator-proof fence. Andy Lowe is one of the landowners involved and a driving force in the project. Andy, how long this fence? This fence is about ten and a half kilometres. Amazing. And uh, when did you put it in? Uh, it was finally finished three years ago. Finally, so it was a big project, took a long time. It was seven years in the making at that stage by the time we got the landowners on board and the construction took over a year. What made you pick that particular length? I mean, look at it, it's just running on and on and on over the hills here. Well, I had some good advisors and they're saying to make it worthwhile we needed two and a half thousand hectares minimum. This landscape's been destroyed and it would take 700 years to come back to where it was. So our whole philosophy is trying to get endangered species reintroduced into a modified landscape where they can coexist with human inhabitation, farming, forestry, recreation. And tourism. Owners of the luxury lodge, the farm at Cape Kidnappers, Julian and Jay Robertson, are also part of the group behind the project. The Lowe's have really been the people behind this thing, and, uh, and I'm just uh, pleased to follow in their footsteps and um, help with something that I think is something 
very good for, for New Zealand. It's a great treat for me to work with somebody that is as committed as they are. And here are two very good reasons why Andy Lowe is so fired up about the sanctuary. Well, this surely is one of the most wonderful moments of my life. I'm with a three-week-old Kiwi chick. So, Andy, where have these come from? The parents of these are at Mangatena for Forest on the edge of the Uwera, and we rob the eggs off the parents, and part of the deal is half the chicks come here and half go back to Mangatanifa. Under current conditions, 95% of kiwis are predated in the wild. And that's because these little fellas here, after two days from hatching, their parents leave them and they're just wandering around the forest floor with no protection. So the reality is without preserves like this one and other sanctuaries around the country, kiwis would become extinct in the wild in New Zealand. Kiwis are not the only endangered birds reared here. The Cape Sanctuary is hoping to make conservation history with the Cook's Petrel. The Cook's Petrel breeding sites are confined to Great Barrier, Little Barrier and Codfish Islands. Tamson and Shane are working in a program to reintroduce the Cook's Petrel to the mainland. These chicks have been taken from their burrows on Great Barrier Island to be hand reared until they fledge. The birds come in as fat chicks, but they have to slim down to get airborne. As they lose weight, their wings grow. And those wings will take them to Alaska and various All the way places. up to the Gulf of Alaska, yeah. East Pacific. His wing is now 219. So that's eight. For all involved, a huge investment of time and money hangs on the hope that they've fooled the chicks into thinking this is home. When they come out of the burrow, their GPS will set. This is where they come to. They'll fly away, and hopefully they'll come back here in four years' time when they're ready to start breeding again. And when those first chicks return, I'll definitely be back here. Heading south along the east coast of the Wairarapa, Castle Point makes a dramatic port of call. This is a group of truly striking limestone landforms. So much of our coast is just so spectacular, like here at Castle Point. And yet, unless we get down on our hands and knees and look at the micro world, we're really going to miss lots of beautiful things. Castle Point was once a major port for Wairarapa before road transport took over. The lighthouse became famous when it featured on a halfpenny stamp in 1947. It's a popular summer holiday spot but it has some of the fiercest winds on the coast, blowing through at 200 kilometres an hour. Any vegetation or wildlife has to be perfectly adapted to survive here. The harsh environment and consequent erosion give lime-loving plants a foothold. Limestone outcrops like this are dotted down the coast. The fact that they are isolated from each other has led plants to evolve separately, sometimes to become unique in just one area. Gary Foster from the Department of Conservation is guiding me towards some real little gems, like the Castle Point Daisy, growing naturally in this one place, and a native Daphne, which is even more special. This is the little Pymelia, Pymelia prostrata. Meaning lying down, Absolutely prostrate. Absolutely, meaning hunkered down, trying to find a place out of the wind, I think, Craig. It's a coastal plant, a sense of it being crushed. It's very sturdy and hardy against the wind. It supports a incredibly rare moth, a notorious moth is the name of the little critter. It's a day flying moth and basically that particular version of the notorious moth is found nowhere else in the world other than this one rock that we're sitting on here at the moment. No kidding? Absolutely. This is the one and only place it lives. Very special. I was told when I was a kid that we mainly have white flowers, both in the alpines and our coastal plants, because moths do the pollinating, not butterflies, and because moths are at night time, they just need the brightness of the flower to show. Mm. Well, you've just kind of thrown all those theories out the door, because <laughs> it's doing it during the daytime. This one's doing it during the daytime. Ah. Well, little notarias, I feel very privileged to have met you.
And now at the southern end of the beach, we're in search of something most New Zealanders have been brought up to fear, but few actually ever see. We have just one native creature poisonous to humans, and that's the catapo spider. And here she is. Only the females bite, and only as a last resort to protect herself and her eggs. They live in dunes as far south as Dunedin, but these days we've modified the dunes so much they're now a rarity. So there's a slim chance you'll ever see one, and an even slimmer chance you'll be bitten, and you certainly won't die. I've arrived in the mainland to the best weather of the trip so far. The sun is glinting off Kaikoura. It always makes my heart sing to arrive here. I've travelled down from Castle Point, past Wellington, across Cook Strait, and I've reached Kaikoura. In a country just redolent with places of beauty and power, Kaikoura stands out as a diamond. I mean, those mountains behind, they're some of the highest, fastest growing mountains near the coast that you'll find anywhere in the world. They're just pouring nutrients into this system. And out into the ocean, even though we can't see it, is a deep undersea trench that upwells nutrients. There's a warm current coming from the tropics. There's a cold current full of oxygen coming from down south. They all meet in this one spot and create this wonderful energy of life right here in Kaikoura. In the trench, the water is rich in plankton. There is plenty of evidence of the abundance of life here fish boil to the surface and attract a huge variety of seabirds. Seals form colonies and orcas patrol the waters. Dusky dolphins swim in their hundreds here. They're incredibly exuberant, gregarious animals, famous for their acrobatic displays. It's behaviour they aren't born with, but learn from each other. No wonder we want to interact with them. The way to attract them is to make lots of movement and noise. Oi, that was close. It's amazing, if not exhausting, trying to be a dolphin. That's so in their element down there, and they're spinning around and around and around. When I'm above them trying to make a noise, and I just feel totally inadequate. They can move so well. But the duskies are not showing off for our benefit. They're simply trying to impress the girls. Up to 10 males will pursue a female in high-speed chases. She'll choose her mate based on speed and agility rather than strength. It's one big party, but the stakes are passing your genes on to the next generation. The upwelling of life in the Hikarangi Trench is also feeding the local human economy in Kaikoura. This is one of the few places in the world where sperm whales are present all year round and very close to shore. Local Māori have had a long presence on this coastline. They now run the internationally award-winning Whale Watch Tours. The crew have an animation to illustrate what lies beyond our sight far below in the trench. Close to Kaikoura, the sea floor plunges a thousand metres into a world of darkness. This massive underwater canyon Home to hundreds of fish species is the hunting ground of the sperm whale and its prey, the giant squid. The hydrophone will pick up the click sounds the whale makes. Every eye on deck scans the horizon for a telltale spout. The moment we find a whale, our skipper Chevy takes us up close.
And there it is, a massive sperm whale. That first sight is a highly emotional experience when you realise this colossal animal beneath is a hot-blooded, air-breathing mammal like us that has chosen to go back to the ocean. At the surface, it will need at least 40 to 50 breaths before it is ready to dive again. It's just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to see this huge leviathan, this great massive whale on the surface. I just never tire of it. And it's so graceful when it makes its dive down to the absolute dark 1,000 metres down. When that whale dives, just paint a picture of what's actually happening when it... Well, 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 when he's going down, he has to adapt to a different atmosphere of pressure as he's going down into the ocean. And his whole body can adapt to this pressure by his rib caging actually collapsing and protecting his vital organs. He's only storing a small amount of oxygen inside those lungs, only about 9%, but um, all the oxygen is actually stored inside his muscle tissue and inside his bloodstream. So, so that's how he combats the bends. Right. When sperm whales hunt for giant squid in the total darkness, they have another amazing adaptation to sense their prey. Well, when he's going down, he's actually switching over into his echolocation or sonar and then just using the sound of the sound travelling and rebounding of objects coming back to the lower jawbone, sending messages to his brain, and then he comes up with what that picture looks like. Once hunted mercilessly, now these whales have a safe haven here in Kaikoura. As well as sea mammals, Kaikoura is a magnet for seabirds. New Zealand is the albatross capital of the world, and here at Kaikoura, all it takes is a 15-minute boat ride to bring you right beside a bird that is usually inaccessible. Gary Melville has had a love affair with the albatross, which started as a fisherman in the Southern Oceans. For the last 10 years, he has taken people out for albatross encounters. It's pretty amazing, so close to shore and seeing so many seabirds. I know, not many places in the world that you can have them this close to the land. They're mainly here because of the deep water trench and the upwellings, which are deep water nutrients that stimulate the plankton and then the whole food chain kicks in. At night time particularly is when they feed and the scattering layer comes almost to the surface in full moon and with upwellings it actually boils to the surface. And you can be out here and the water's like a thick soup with the strength of the plankton. Some of these birds will hang around Kaikoura, eating and sleeping on the water until the mating urge catches up with them. Around September, they'll fly back to their breeding ground in the Chatham or the Subantarctic Islands. Albatross mate for life and take turns to feed and look after their chicks. They have the longest wingspan of any bird on the planet. And on the lightest of wind, by riding the updrafts on the back of swells, they can glide for days, barely flapping their wings. My fascination with albatross began when I was a child and became an obsession when I visited their breeding sites in the subantarctic. Their eyes drew me in almost as if I might see what they encounter on their long, lonely voyages above the cold, wind-battered southern oceans. Just north of Kaikoura is Mongamaunu Beach. Often there are some good little waves here. This girl's a great surfer. She's getting into more waves than I am.
Even the surf ski is getting into it. To me, there's nothing else like surfing in the world. Just being on the edge of the great pulsing ocean, riding waves that come from way out at sea, every single wave's got its own motion and I'm trying to flow with it as I go. It exhausts me, really, but it actually makes my soul very, very quiet. It actually settled me right down. And it's been doing that, well, since I was about 12 years old. I've come inland from Kaikoura, past Christchurch, recently racked by earthquakes, to this peaceful last stop on my East Coast journey. Banks Peninsula was named after Joseph Banks, the naturalist on Captain Cook's voyage. But Banks would see a completely different landscape today. Most of the native trees were cut down to build Christchurch and make way for farms. On the summit ridge, I'm actually walking along the rim of an ancient volcano. About 20 million years ago, it just erupted out into the sea. It wasn't connected to the mainland at all. That connection only happened after the ice ages when the gravels of the Canterbury Plains joined it up to the mainland. And that's pretty ironic, really, because Captain Cook, he was a great navigator and very good cartographer, and he drew Banks Peninsula as an island, one of the few mistakes he made. Came past on a foggy day, didn't recognise it was connected. If he'd come 20,000 years before, before that last ice age, it would have been an island. Akaroa Harbour is the crater of the volcano. It's a welcome change from the exposed coastlines I've been travelling. Enclosed by the hills, the tranquil waters are a respite from the swells and open seas. And it's a perfect place to see the rare Hector's dolphin. The Hector's dolphin is recognisable by its attractive black, grey and white markings and distinctive rounded dorsal fin. It is the smallest oceanic dolphin in the world. And to give you an idea of just how small, a sperm whale can be around 20 metres long. A dusky dolphin, two metres, and the little Hector's dolphin, not much more than a metre long, about the length of a large dog. As a small species, their lifespan is shorter than other larger dolphins. A dusky may live to 35, but a Hector will live to only around 20 years old. My friend Liz Sluton, a marine biologist, has been studying and championing the Hector's dolphin for over 25 years. Most of her research has taken place right here. Akaroa Harbour is a brilliant place to study Hector's dolphins wow. because there's a long sheltered harbour and the dolphins come right inside it during the summer months especially. So in winter you need to go to the harbour entrance and you'll find good numbers in the harbour entrance and up and down the open coast. But in summer they come right in to the top of the harbour. The calmer waters make this the best place for humans to study and interact with the Hector's. Just how social are these guys? Because we're up with the dusky dolphins, they're yeah. all over the place together. They're yeah, in big yeah. groups or pods. Are these ones just as social? We call the dusky dolphins the Italians of the dolphin world because they're always ah, you know, jumping out and carrying on and very, very fast and furious and big groups, as you say. Um, Hector's dolphins are a bit more sedate. They're not quite such show-offs. So they are usually in groups of two to eight. And then from time to time, these groups come together, form one large group of 20, 50, even 100 occasionally animals. There is a lot of stability, obviously, between mothers and calves have a long um, bond of a year and a half, two years or so. Um, and even then, the calf may well stay with its mother a bit longer, but will no longer suckle. Hector's dolphins don't do nuclear families. So when you see a small group of eight dolphins, that's not mum and dad and the kids. That's maybe mother and offspring, but beyond that, it's friends. Sadly, many Hector's dolphins die in set nets. These nets are too fine for the dolphin's echolocation to detect, so they get caught and drown. Over 60% of Hector's deaths are caused by set nets. Around Banks Peninsula here, the big problem is that the protection from those fishing nets goes to four miles offshore, but the dolphins go to 20 miles offshore. So there's protection for them, but it's nowhere near uh, complete. In the last 40 years, Hector's dolphin numbers have dropped from 30,000 to just 8,000. 
there are dozens of fishing methods that could be used and they might not be quite as um, economically attractive but they are actually much better in terms of preserving the fish stocks as well. The frustrating thing is that nobody is saying these people must stop fishing. We're simply asking, could you please use fishing methods that don't kill dolphins? That's all, it's as simple as that. In a country where we treasure our national parks, I can't understand why so little of our coast is set aside for marine reserves to protect vulnerable species. But I'm optimistic. All up and down this coast, I've met people who really care about it. They're restoring the native vegetation to the sand dunes. They're even hoping that they can bring kiwi back to the beach and cook petrol from the offshore islands and get them breeding on the mainland. And down here, where the dolphins and the whales are, there are still people pushing hard for those elusive marine reserves.